Thanks, Quinn. Uh, yeah, so you either you either come back because you didn't know I was given this, or you enjoyed my last talk. I'm not not sure which. Um, but so Dr. Worth did put this together, and he wrote a pretty extensive script. So I'm mostly going to go off of that. So if, if I'm not looking at you guys and looking at the screen, that's that's what I'm reading off the <laughs> off the script that I was I was provided. So. Um, so blue catfish were introduced in Virginia tidal rivers in the 1970s, as we've mentioned previously. Um, again, that was a, a different different era in time where fish were more readily transported between locations, as, as we're all well aware of. Um, and during that time period, a lot of species in the a lot of a lot of stocks in, in Chesapeake Bay were were in decline due to due to habitat alteration, overfishing, and pollution. So it seemed like a good idea at the time. And so it's one thing I need to point out. So Dr. Worth has fuzzed out people's faces, and I'm not sure why, but you'll see that throughout. <laughs> um, but so with, with blue catfish in Chesapeake Bay, there are three messaging problems that arise. One is how we define invasive. Um, with, among groups of people, they may have different interpretations of the word invasive. Um, and even among groups of scientists, we may not necessarily agree exactly on what that means. Um, the second is how we study invasive species. Most of the time we're looking at ecological impact type studies. Um, we're looking at what species are likely to establish in an area. Um, we often ignore social aspects of, of invasive species science. Um, and the third problem with invasive uh, blue catfish messaging is how we communicate uh, to the public. I'm going to talk about that for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> um, and again, I'm not sure why. but so. So we did a content analysis looking at 74 non-primary articles um, that were mostly from news, news sources. Um, and they, they all looked at blue catfish in their non-native range. Um, so when we, we summarized the language and kind of looked at over the overall tone of messaging in those works, um, and we established our narrative from this analysis, and we make four claims. First, blue catfish storyline was written before the science was necessarily done. Um, and the news reports that often came out prior to the science being done often had a militaristic and emotive tone. The second um, is that metaphors and hyperboles have been, have been used extensively and have polarized um, stakeholders and replaced science. Third, despite many studies, findings remain inconclusive due to insufficient evidence. And a lot of that is we don't have anything to compare our evidence to. Um, for instance, we did some estimation of consumption, population level consumption, but in most cases, we don't know what they mean because we don't have an estimate of how many American shad are out there. Um, and finally, the blue catfish narrative should shift from the invasiveness metaphor to one of more collaborative problem solving, which is currently underway with the uh, Chesapeake Bay program leading an effort to, to better figure out what the objectives are and how we can manage blue catfish to meet diverse stakeholder needs. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go through a lot of different things that are out there um, that people have, have clung to. Um, so if blue catfish are destroying Chesapeake Bay, they must be removed. Language affects our willingness to change behavior, and the media often used hyperbole, an exaggerated figure of speech, to, to share their, their message. Um, and here's an example of that. Um, well, blue catfish have come to dominate several Chesapeake Bay waterways, using their black hole mouths to vacuum up whatever marine life gets in their way. Um, and, and so the narrative kind of played out in the press ahead of the science. And uh, in, in social media as well, uh, before we had hard scientific evidence uh, of, of what the ecological effects are. Um, and so here's another one from 2011. Not just a new species, it's an apex predator that rules at the top of the food webs like polar bears or Bengal tigers. <laughs> and so as you can imagine, if you see this and you're someone in the, in the general public, you think, well, that's terrible. <laughs> um, and so now I'm going to get into some poetry for you. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> oh, oh, my love's like a rose. A red, red rose is a famous uh, simile by Robert Burns. Uh, so here's something else that uh, where someone used a simile. Um, up close and in person, blue catfish are gruesome creatures. They grow big and ugly and gray. They croak like pigs. <coughs> and because they have no scales, they are especially slimy, even as fish go. <laughs> so... Not, not very appealing for the, for the blue catfish, and the species was vilified in, in a lot of the public, public discourse. The wild blue catfish is one of the greatest environmental threats the Chesapeake Bay has ever faced. This is hyperbole, um, and also similes abound. Um, 
blue cats feed in the top of the water column and pin their prey against the surface in a feeding frenzy, much like bluefish or rockfish. <coughs> These are not docile fish. They are apex predators, just like sharks, but they reproduce like rabbits. <laughs> um, and I noticed Vascar didn't pre present a comparison of rabbits and, and blue cats, so <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that one, that one out there to be determined later, if that's true or not. Um, so fisheries management is about managing human behavior. Um, and the typical stakeholder is seeking simple, meaningful explanations. Invasive species are those that have harm to the economy, environment, or human health. Um, and so presenting that this is that blue catfish are a bigger, bigger threat than snakeheads is a simple message that folks can take in and, um, and understand. But this was kind of circulated before. Um, it's misleading and assumes that we fully understand both the impacts of snakeheads and blue catfish, and I don't really think that we've done either of those uh, super effectively. So it provides a simple message for the public, but it may not be the, what we want to circulate. Um, so back into literary devices <laughs> um, and Shakespeare. So, uh, metaphors compare two things and replaces the word or name for one object with that of the other. For example, Shakespeare's <laughs> shall I compare thee to a summer's day is a famous metaphor. Um, one for blue Blue catfish is bad for the bay, it's terrific for tacos, which is again a simple message that, that folks can, can take in. Um, and, it, and it promotes that you're doing something good for the bay by eating, eating blue catfish. Um, and it also may provide an aff affordable food source. And, and these terms and invasivorism all sound like motherhood and apple pie. I'm not sure what that's supposed to mean, but I thought maybe you would. <laughs> um, and so comparing invasive species to mob crime families is easy to understand, but misplaces the guilt. Metaphors should not replace science when informing policy. We're not fighting crime, we're managing fish in the ecosystem. The news media reminded us that also troubling is their food, which includes some of the same species that wildlife managers are trying to save and restore, the blue crab, American shad, American eel, and river herring. Um, yet blue catfish are opportunistic omnivores. They are eating this stuff, but not, they're not targeting it. They're not going out of their way to eat blue crabs. Um, it's just what's abundant in certain areas of the rivers, and that's where they're consuming these things. Um, in fact, with some work by Joe Schmidt, uh, he was a previous student before, well, we overlapped, but he's, he's now moved on. Uh, most of their diet was plants. A lot of the plants that they were eating were invasive uh, themselves, including hydrilla, eating a lot of Asian clams, gizzard shad, and white perch, which are the most abundant resources in the system. Um, and it's really only the largest fish that are, are consuming um, a lot of these species that we're, we're concerned about. And it's important to note that those larger fish make up a fairly small proportion of the population. And so while, while everybody's concerned about uh, impacts, um, we talked about this in, a, in the previous two talks, the James River and Potomac Rivers have supported uh, pretty, pretty excellent uh, trophy fisheries and were listed as one the top 10 rivers to catch monster catfish in 2015. And sports anglers have recognized that the media is portraying the, uh, the blue catfish as a villain and have not really appreciated it. Um, and so the question is, uh, villains or trophies? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of catfish and by opposing <laughs> end to them, to die, to sleep, no more. Um, and so in summary, <laughs> the public discourse inspires a Shakespearean drama. And if you're me, you've only heard that in the movie Billy Madison. <laughs> um, and so at least a recent literature review on the subject of invasive species showed a dramatic rise in the studies in the last 20 years. Um, but a lot of those haven't, haven't been focused on social dimensions. And so we need an evaluation of the hazard and uh, lack of institutional trust were noted as two, two, two areas of notable conflict in, in the works that have been done. All right. <laughs> um, and so human beliefs, such as whether we believe humans are separate from nature or part of nature, explain dominant attitudes. Two opposing metaphors are nativism and cosmopolitanism, and they reflect our normative beliefs about good and bad. Um, nativism is considered part as, as pure and in harmony when non-natives are not present. Um, and this ideal condition is seldom present, as we're all aware of. Our ecosystems are highly impacted in most cases. Um, and this ideal condition is, as I said, seldom present. Um, cosmopolitanism is kind of on the other side of the spectrum, 
where it considers the reality that we are dealing with altered ecosystems. And labeling a fish invasive automatically means there's something to battle, not a research, not a, not a resource to manage. And invasive species, consequently, are are then uh, a harmful entity. And so that's a nativ nativism to belief, which may be a stronger voice for change and create a sense of urgency. Uh, gotta make my notes smaller because there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, so three metaphors can be used for messaging non-native species, um, and they can be useful or misleading. The driver model indicates that uh, invasive species are drivers of ecosystem change. Um, and with the driver model, we would then expect if we reduce blue catfish, that we'll have a proportional response in the populations. And so if we get rid of blue catfish, the American shad runs will come back and it'll, everybody will be happy. Um, there's the other, another model or, um, or metaphor for this is the backseat driver, where blue catfish are are also working in, in coordination with the ecosystem change and the passenger model where blue catfish are able to colonize um, due, to, due, to, due to ecosystem change. And this, this framing language affects the public's willingness to take action. If the backstreet, backseat driver or passenger models are more accurate than efforts to reduce abundance uh, without concurrent ecosystem restoration actions will not result in significant changes expected. Um, and so in, in this case with blue catfish, we believe that the backseat driver model is likely the most most likely scenario that we're seeing here. Um, they probably aren't aren't absolute drivers, and um, but they they are certainly creating some some issues. And so in the James River, I have a ton more slides. We're just going to skip this. <laughs> um, so white catfish and, and channel catfish were were both before expansion of blue cat were in the, in the rivers before the expansion of blue cats. And it's kind of, it was surprising to me to look at this long-term harvest data that catfish harvest was actually higher um, previously than it, than it is today. Um, and so this, this would have been driven mostly by channel catfish with some white catfish tossed in there. Um, there was a decline. Blue catfish are stocked and mm -hmm. harvest went down a little bit, likely due to that competition with, with those two species that were there previously. Channel catfish are non-native. Um, and then as blue catfish expand, you see harvest go up again. And this is total catfish harvest by weight. And so now blue catfish dominate catfish landings in all Virginia coastal rivers and provide economic benefits. Blue catfish have replaced non-indigenous uh, channel catfish and white catfish in most rivers. Um, and blue catfish likely provide a predator, predator trap as fish try to move upstream to spawn. Um, after a recent press release, a co-author on this work, Joe Schmidt, received an email from emeritus professor John Nay who wrote a reason for concern. Um, he pointed out that although we found that, that blue catfish are eating small proportions of, uh, their diets are based on small proportions of imperiled and at-risk species, um, the way we've presented it previously ignores the fact that we don't know what that means on a population scale. And so we've, we've estimated total consumption, um, and we've, but we don't know what the in-stream population of allocenes are, and then consequently what the percentage of in-river allocenes are being consumed. So consumption estimates are highly uncertain, and predation impacts are even less certain due to the lack of reliable estimates of prey populations. We need to talk. <laughs> blue catfish are destroying the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, due to their large size and predatory habits, blue cats are consuming many native fish species at an enormous rate, and they have few natural predators that can prevent them from out competing native species. Um, so, and, and what we kind of have evidence of is that blue catfish have replaced, replaced channel catfish, which were non-native, stocked in the 1880s, and it seems they've also displaced white catfish. So competition, competition seems like it's more of a, an important factor here than predation. I think I only have four slides left. <laughs> um, and so the path forward is to engage in a conflict resolution approach, which is, is really moving forward pretty nicely. Um, again, with the Chesapeake Bay Program's invasive catfish work group, we had a really great meeting a couple weeks ago um, that really brought a lot of stakeholders in and got a lot of people's opinions and, and interests considered more so than we've been doing in the past. Um, and so we've been escalating the rhetoric and polarizing the plural views and values of stakeholders toward blue catfish. Some stakeholders have a direct benefit from managing fish, while other stakeholders lack a vested interest in ecosystem restoration. 
Elsewhere, managers have had success with collaborative stakeholder workshops that help to identify conflicting values, their importance, and reveal explicit trade-offs. And so one big push in this situation has been invasive orism. Um, if you can't beat them, eat them. And so when a species has high value, that value becomes an incentive to increase its spread. There are already stakeholders um, that in those recent meetings that have said, well, we don't want to reduce abundances, we want a sustainable fishery. So we're kind of running into a situation where um, it seems like the objectives of some folks that are using well, let's reduce abundances are contradicting, contradicting perceived objectives. And, and so invasive avorism takes attention away from the management practices that are actually known to solve the problem associated with the ecosystem change. And so the good for tacos option ignores the threat of contaminants, of fillets, some of that work's been done by VIMS. Um, and, bio, and with bioaccumulated toxins, it ignores the fact that some anglers will not kill the largest, most fecund fish. Um, a lot of the trophy anglers, as has mentioned uh, in Rob's presentation, are strict catch and release folks. Um, and it ignores the potential harvest of white cats, white cats through bycatch and misidentification, which I've seen white cats at, at fish markets. So um, those are certainly being harvested. So getting the story right is critically important. Too many nutrients flow into our tidal rivers, stimulating phytoplankton blooms that are sometimes harmful, enhancing gizzard shad, which are excellent at redistributing nutrients and supporting high abundances of blue cats. All of our tidal rivers are impaired according to accepted water quality criteria. To believe that removal of blue catfish will solve these problems is, is a dream. And with that, I will take any questions. <laughs>